I'm very thrilled to introduce to you Joe Serenzioni. Uh, Joe is the president of Plowshares Fund. Joe himself um, is uh, uh, author of a book called Nuclear Nightmares, Securing the World Before It's Too Late. You are here at the critical time. If you have been working on the Iran issue for many years, thank you for your persistence. If you are new to this issue, I congratulate you on your timing. This is the pivotal moment. It is not very often that you get to see the hinge of history move. We may be at such a moment. The stakes couldn't be higher. We have been trying to negotiate a deal with Iran for over 10 years to stop the nuclear program that they started in earnest about 15 years ago. The current round of negotiations has been going on for over a year. There, it is caught up in a huge partisan battle, basically over the direction of U.S. foreign policy and the efforts to try to thwart everything the President of the United States is doing and to advance uh, the agenda of the other side. So you, it, I believe that over the next few days, we are going to see a deal struck in Vienna. The deadline for the talks is November 24th, that's Monday. I think it'll go down to the last minute of the last hour. As Henry Kissinger says, the, the most important hour of negotiations is the last hour. That's where all the deals get done. I'm gonna tell you in 10 minutes everything you need to know to understand this. First, the deal itself. What we're talking about is a deal that will verifiably limit Iran's nuclear program so that we can be assured that it's purely for peaceful purposes and cannot be used quickly or easily to make weapons. It's all about the centrifuges. These devices, they look like water heaters. They're high-tech devices constructed of, of very sophisticated alloys with rotors that whip around uranium gas at supersonic speeds in order to purify it. They take the natural uranium out of the ground, Iran has uranium mines, turn it into a gaseous form and whip it around in order to get a higher ratio of the particular isotope of uranium you need, 235. Most of uranium is 238, perfectly nice isotope, but it's 235 that goes pop. It's 235, when you hit it with the neutron, it splits in half, and it puts out a spray of two other neutrons that could hit nearby 235 atoms, doing that chain reaction that you all know about. One, two, four, eight, you get the picture. But most important is when you hit that atom of 235 with a neutron, a tiny little part of it, a tiny little part of the mass turns into energy. And when you plug that into Einstein's formula, the only formula most of us know, E equals mc squared, energy equals mass times c, the speed of light squared. That is a very big number. And that's why everybody's doing this. That's what nuclear power, that's what nuclear weapons are all about, an extreme amount of energy from a very small amount of matter. So you take that uranium gas, you put it in centrifuges, and you turn it around, and a tiny, the heavier element goes to the outside, the inside of the element, the inside, ratio of gas gets a little higher ratio of the lighter element, 235, you suck that gas out, a tube in the middle of that centrifuge. Now it's slightly higher ratio, slightly enriched in 235, but only slightly, so you do it again to the centrifuge next door, and again, and again, and you line 10,000 of these suckers up, and you do that for about three months, and you stop, now you have uranium gas that's enriched to somewhere between 3 and 5 percent U-235, 3 to 5 percent enriched levels. You can stop, you can take that gas, turn it into an oxide form, kind of a powder, pound it into fuel pellets, put the fuel pellets into fuel rods, put the fuel rods in a reactor, gets real hot, those neutrons start going, they start hitting, they start turning mass into energy, it turns the water into steam, the steam turns the turbines and electricity. 20% of the electricity in the United States is produced in exactly that way, and that's all the Iranians say they want. They just want to make electricity. They have the only nuclear power reactor in the Middle East in Bushir. Here's the problem. You take that same process and you keep it going a few months longer, 
four or five more months, now when you take the gas out, it's 90% pure. Now you take that 90% pure gas and you turn it into a metal, and you turn, forge that metal into two hemispheres, and you fire one into the other, and you get Hiroshima. The uranium bomb that destroyed Hiroshima, 15,000 tons of destructive power from about 100 pounds of mass. That little atom, lots of atoms splitting at once. So the question is, do you trust the Iranians? Clearly, we don't. And why would you? They have a history of deceiving us in their nuclear program, a history of building secret facilities underground, hoping we wouldn't see them, and we have a history of discovering them. And we're now at the point where it looks like we might be able to resolve this issue. The former Holocaust-denying anti-Semitic president, Ahmadinejad, is gone. There's a new pragmatic president, Rouhani, in charge. I had dinner with Rouhani last September at the UN when he came. This is the guy we can do business with. I wouldn't call him a moderate. I wouldn't call the regime a nice regime. This is a brutal regime. Have no illusions about what this regime is about. But we don't just talk to our friends, we talk to our adversaries. Rouhani wants to talk to us. The great tragedy of the US-Iran relationship has been when one side has been willing to talk, the other side has not. You've got two people who are willing to talk, and they are talking a lot. Last September, when I also had dinner with the new president and the foreign minister, Zarif, in September of uh, 2013, President Obama called him. First phone call between the president of the United States and the president of the Islamic Republic. Then the secretary of state, John Kerry, started talking with the foreign minister, Zarif. First talk ever between the United States Secretary of State and the Foreign Minister of the Islamic Republic. Now they can't stop talking. They talk all the time. In fact, the most striking thing about the dinner I had in September was how normal it was, how many people were there. Madeleine Albright, uh, Stephen Hadley, former Bush National Security Advisor, Brent Scowcroft, former Bush National Security Advisor, the other one, uh, talking about 25 of us talking to the Iranians, having a very intimate discussion, hard questions, good answers. This dialogue is now normal, and that's exactly what worries the opponents of this deal. I believe that the negotiators by themselves can craft a very good deal that can limit Iran's program, give them some centrifuges, put on a verification system of seals and monitors and inspections and audits and cameras. We can put their program in a steel box with a camera on it, we can know exactly what they're doing, and should they try to break out, we would know with months of warning and could take appropriate action. I think the deal that they are, are working on can solve our security problem. But this is Washington. This is Washington. And this is a political problem now. There are people who oppose to, opposed to this deal. It's a small minority of experts who have quibbles about the deal, worry about it. That's the minor issue. There's the bigger issue of people who don't want any deal. They take their cues from Bibi Netanyahu, the Israeli prime minister. His approach to the Iranian nuclear program is like Rome's to Carthage. He wants to raise it to the ground so it will never rise again. And there's some truth to that. The best way to solve this is to get rid of the program altogether. The problem is there's not a politician in Iran that could make that deal. Nobody could make that deal. It's a non-starter. So if somebody says the program has to be stopped, they cannot be allowed to enrich uranium, yeah, 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 I agree. Go get that deal. You can't get that deal. Here's the deal you can get. And it's good, and it works. So don't make the best the enemy of the good. And But the trick is they're using that to disrupt any deal, because the truth is they don't want to make a deal with the regime, they want to overthrow the regime. And the same people who tricked us into an unnecessary war in Iraq are trying to trick us into an unnecessary <coughs> war with Iran. And if you think I'm kidding, just read the editorial pages of the Wall Street Journal. You can go last week and see Ruel Mark Grech and Mark Dubowitz saying it's time to end diplomacy and start preemptive military strikes on Iran. Military strikes on Iran. Go read Bill Kristol. Not the funny one, the angry one. <laughs> Bill Crystal, editor of the Weekly Standard, 
Ann Coulter, completely unapologetic about the Iraq war. It was a great war, she says. <laughs> they want to go do it again. This is their plan. These neoconservatives have sway among certain members of Congress. I would say John McCain, Mark Rubio, Ted Cruz, etc. But the real problem, the problem you're going to encounter, is that this is now caught up in the awful, ugly, vicious, worst I've ever seen partisan conflict in Washington. So people who really don't care about Iran's nuclear program, really don't care about Iran, have, don't share the neocon agenda, don't want to give President Obama victory. They've been doing it for six years and it's worked. It has worked. They haven't given him anything. I don't care what it is, immigration, health care, high-speed rail, you name it, climate change, nothing. And it's worked. It's made this president appear weak, appear ineffective. Example, prime example, today Marco Rubio is circulating a letter signed by 44 Republican senators to the President of the United States blasting him, warning him that if he circumvents Congress, he will pay a price for this. No Dems on that letter. This was such an incendiary letter, such an outrageous letter, using the code words that they use, weak, dangerous, threatens American national security. Are you sure you're an American? Oh. <laughs> you know. It exposes the partisan nature. It's a real failure on their part. It's a failure they couldn't get any Dems on this letter. It shows what you're up against. And this is what part of what encourages me, because I think this president has turned a page after the election. He's been holding back, but now you see what's happening. You see what he's doing. I know you're disappointed in a lot of things. I get that. But since the election, he's made a deal with North Korea that's freed two long-held American prisoners. He's made a deal with India that's going to lead to a new trade pact. He's made a deal with China that could be the most significant climate change action in history. See the pattern here? Tonight he's announcing immigration reform that is long overdue, that he held off for political reasons. The Republicans are blasting him, saying, no, 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 he's going. He's doing it. And he's going to do this deal. We're not circumventing Congress. Congress has no role in approving this deal. It's not a treaty. It is not a treaty. It doesn't have to come to Congress. It's, a, it's an agreement, an international agreement. Presidents are authorized to make this and, in fact, do make these kinds of agreements all the time. It's like the China climate change agreement doesn't require approval. I think he's going to do this, and I think he's going to get blasted for it, and that's where you come in. You got to show the people you talk to that you care about this, that you support them, that you want them to do this to the right thing. If you're talk don't think you're wasting your time if you're talking to a liberal Democrat, if you're talking to Dianne Feinstein, or, or, or uh, if you met the new senator from Connecticut, Chris Murphy. What a hero this guy is. Watch this guy. He has Kennedy written all over him. Watch this guy. They got to know that you want them to do this, that you have their political back, that they will get rewarded for doing this. As President Kennedy said after he passed the limited test ban treaty and crowds started to cheer whenever he mentioned it in his speeches, if I had known it was so popular, I would have done it a long time ago. <laughs> That's the kind of thing you got to do. And for those on the fence, if any of you are talking to Senator Warner, you got to move him over. One is a good guy, he's a reasonable guy, but he's hedging his bet. Hedging his bet. You've got to move him over. You've got to show him this is too important, that we shouldn't be playing politics with U.S. national security, and that's exactly what's going on. That's exactly what's going on. I think we're going to win this because, and I'll stop in this one minute. I've got 60 more seconds. We're going to win this because when you look at the bigger picture, the geopolitics of what's going on, all the strategic drivers are driving towards this deal, towards this agreement. You can make the deal, and there's an urgent need to make the deal. The Middle East is a mess. Iran's one of the few stable countries there. We're never going to be BFFs with Iran, but we share strategic objectives with them now in a way we never have before. We both have an interest in stabilizing Afghanistan. We both have an interest in stabilizing Iraq. We both have an interest in ending the bloody conflict in Syria. We have different goals. We have different purposes, but we both want the same things. This is how politics is done. This is how regional crises are settled. You don't just talk with your friends, you talk with everyone. 
And in this case, we have to have Iran, Iran's help. We're in a tactical alliance with them now fighting ISIL. We're doing the airstrikes. They got the boots on the ground. We don't officially coordinate. We communicate with them. And this is true. We communicate with them. We let them know where we're doing the airstrikes so their troops aren't there. They let us know where the troops are so there's no contact between American forces. That's got to be revved up. That's got to be revved up. The geopolitics of the region are pressing towards a deal. I think it's going to be enough to undercut the partisan politics of Washington. We're going to get a deal that's going to make us safer, that could change the course of history in the Middle East. I just want to take my last 10 seconds here to thank you very much for making this possible. What you're going to do in these next few days is really going to matter. Thank you for making the change we all so desperately need.